Hello, everybody. Welcome to a British audio file. I'm here again with Ian from E Acoustics. So I'm much thinner, Ian White, <laughs> this month. I, I thought I'd wait for you to say that rather than yeah, thirty thir this. thirty pounds since my birthday. So, oh well, well done. Thank you. <laughs> Must have taken some hard work. Uh, it's it's called stop eating. <laughs> So great. So um, we did a series together, which was um, our favorite uh, amplifiers, and that was um, well received. So we thought we'd do the same thing with speakers. And today we're starting with bookshelf speakers below a thousand pounds or well, there can be different prices in different markets. But in the UK, um, they're below a thousand pounds. And um, I think it's probably similar. What, 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 what's the cutoff point in the US, Ian? Oh, I mean, for me, it's a thousand dollars. I mean, okay. I mean, I mean, maybe a, a few dollars over. Because the thing is, prices are fluctuating like crazy here now. I mean, yeah. we 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 ran an update on our modern vintage audio speaker, audio file speaker article last week. It's it's like a series I've done over the last two years, and every single speaker on the list has climbed by five hundred dollars a pair in a span of six months. So it's, I mean, so before we even made our picks for today's show, um, I actually went online just to double check because I was like, how many of these speakers are even now still even below a thousand? So I, I actually went for, in some cases, the lower model, right? Things that I've actually heard, but just because I want to keep, uh, I want to keep it affordable for people, but it's, it's crazy. Like if you walk into even like Best Buy here, and you look at the yeah. prices, they're, they're literally like taking the cards out <laughs> and putting in new ones uh, uh, like every Change, week because the prices are going all the time. Yeah. 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 No, I had to I had to check mine as well. So um, so I thought there's so many good choices really at this price. And I thought what we'd do is we'd basically pick one speaker in the end that we'd personally choose. If we were choosing a speaker below a thousand pounds, circa a thousand dollars, maybe a little bit more, um, what you would choose, but there's other, there's plenty of honorable mentions that I think we need yeah. to probably discuss beforehand. So do you want to get started? Yeah, I do. And I, I'm actually going to start at the top of my range only because of the fact that it's a speaker that I was fortunate to spend a lot of time with. I had one of the first review samples and, you know, it's been a while since I've had it, I had it here, but I've listened to it more than, you know, just a show or in a store. I had it for three months. And so, so that would, for me, it would be the Sonus Faber Lumina One, which I still believe retails for under a thousand dollars US. And what's really interesting about the speaker is that you know, in my discussions with uh, Livio Kakuza, who's the you know head designer at, at Sonus Faber, you know, for them to make a sub one thousand dollar loudspeaker was a little more difficult. And especially because it was a product that was coming out, you know, I guess at the beginning or the first stage of the pandemic. You no, know, you no. Know, timing wasn't great. Timing wasn't great on that one, but you know, the Lumina range is actually, I believe, manufactured in China, and okay. the rest of the Sonus Faber range is still manufactured in their factory in Italy. And in fact, during the pandemic, they actually bought the woodworking company that they have used since inception when Franco Serblin, the late Franco Serblin, started Sonus Faber. Yeah, um, they were using like essentially like a very high end outsized cabinet maker, like literally like I think one or two towns over from where their factory is. And now that Sonus is Sonus Faber is owned by Macintosh Group, they had access to a lot more capital, and they were able to now actually buy this specific company, which gives them now total control over you know basically you know the, their supply chains and everything like that. And the the Lumina was actually a uh, I guess a, a you know, a project that they were working on for a while because they realized that, you know, as well as Sonus Faber has done, you know, their products are not really that affordable. And if they're going to bring in a new generation of potential customers, you know, you can't make, you know, three, four, five thousand dollars your entry point, you know, if you if you expect to get anybody under the age of 30 to buy your products. So the Lumina One was is a rather chunky, you know, two-way bookshelf loudspeaker. And What's also great about it is that even for a thousand dollars, it's still hardwood in terms of like the the front baffle, oh. because the rest of the speaker they went back to the old Sonus Faber kind of style with the leather, mm -hmm. um, which a lot of people who love Sonus Faber who remember the early designs remember the leather that they used on the front, and you know so it used it's, to be all about the wood and the leather Sonus Faber. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, that's that's what yeah. they were known for. So I think this speaker was an attempt to kind of recapture some of the past. 
Yeah. And so it was almost like saying to a new customer, you know, this is where we started and this is what people loved about us. But, you know, now we're using more advanced drivers and we're able to make a cabinet that's just as stiff, but, you know, it's 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 less expensive. And I was really surprised by the speaker. I mean, I mean, I was excited because, like, I mean, I haven't had a chance to review. I mean, I've listened to every speaker they make over the years at shows. And um, I was supposed to actually go to the factory during the pandemic. I was invited to Italy, but you know, the, the, the pandemic made it impossible. And the Lumina One was a really surprising loudspeaker. It it had, um, I mean, it doesn't have as much bass as I would like from a nine hundred and ninety five dollar bookshelf loudspeaker. I think there's a, there are a lot of other models, you know, in our range that you and I are going to talk about that have, you know, a, a more extended low end, firmer low ends, and a, a little more impact. But the the mid range and treble on this loudspeaker are for nine hundred ninety five dollars. Um, nothing to sneeze at. And I've listened to a lot of speakers that are more expensive that didn't actually, I didn't really engage me in the same way. So, and also the one thing I will say is that originally, I think they also designed it for customers who were not necessarily going to have um, the most powerful, you know, integrated amplifier. Like it was designed for people who might have an entry level entry, uh, in, um, integrated amplifier, and it was meant to be like a almost like an office system or a small den type of system. And when I started feeding this loudspeaker more power, and when with amplifiers that probably aren't what the average person who buys the speaker are going to use, I started to realize this might be a lot better speaker than I thought. Yeah. And it was actually a speaker that I actually regretted sending back. It was sort of like like a month later, I was listening to something else, and I said, "Sonos Fabra was better." And you know, so I just the pandemic just made it crazy. And but I I actually think I would buy a pair of them. Like I mean, right. I think that would be my highest endorsement. I would I would definitely buy a pair. Yeah, well, it's not something. It's not a speaker that I've heard, and I've recently got in touch with the UK PR people who at Sonos Faber, and they are going to be sending some stuff through but i requested one of the others which i'm going to keep under my hat for now um first so uh that'll be coming through um shortly but uh, yeah no there's some interesting stuff happening there so uh, i think that's probably a good solid honorable mention i i'm um, gonna take us back a little bit to andrew jones and the original elac <laughs> debut i know he's revised it with a 2.0 before he left that was a speaker that when that first came out was quite a sensation and I thought it did some very clever things. The bass performance was very, very strong. It had a warm, rich mid-range. It was never the most detailed and the most revealing speaker on top, even around that price. I thought there were some other speakers, but it was just um, a big sound from a small speaker, impressive dynamics. And I also felt that it was quite a sensible voicing for the kind of amplifiers it was going to yeah. be used with. You know, I think Andrew deliberately tailed off a bit at the top, knowing that some of those more kind of, you know, accessible amplifiers tend to be quite often quite bright on top. Right. But, um, yeah, that was that was something that uh, I don't know what your impression was of that, but that was something that I really like the Elac speakers. And I mean, um, I mean, I'm not friends with Andrew, but I've met him multiple times and I've had a chance to listen to it. Um, I, I thought the Elac speakers were ingenious. Because clearly the people at ELAC in Germany, you know, knew Andrew from his days at KEF and what he had done at Pioneer and TAD. And it's sort of like the way that he had voiced the Pioneer speakers that were primarily sold at Best Buy and Crutchfield and other like sort of more mainstream stores. They were designed for people who were going to use AVRs or, or really inexpensive integrated amplifiers with them and, you know, with a slightly, you know, maybe harsh sounding treble, a little, a little more energy on top. And I just thought the Elacs were just really smart speakers. I mean, if I was getting into high-end audio for the first time, I could see why a pair of the Elacs would appeal to me, to appeal to someone because they were affordable. They sounded really, they sounded quite good with, with most genre. I remember the first time I heard them, I heard them at a trade show with Andrew and he played like a cross section of rock, classical jazz blues. And everyone in the room was kind of like, how much are these? Two thousand, three thousand dollars? And he was like, "Oh, they're like four ninety nine. And, and, and there was like an audible gas from all the hi fi reviewers who were like, four hundred ninety nine US." And he said, "Yeah." And I was like, "They're going to sell a lot of these speakers." <laughs> and he did. <laughs> and he did. And right. Then, right. Yeah. 
so that the ones also that he followed up with, which is quite interesting, which I, I was always a little less uh, warm towards the Unify range. I thought that that was, it was a good speaker, but I felt that it still had similar kind of voicing, but was quite demanding of amplification. And yeah, I yeah. thought that if you're actually going to spend that kind of money on amplification, you probably want a better speaker. Right. Um, I don't know whether that, but I've only spent very brief time listening to them at, you know, odd dealer demos and stuff. So I don't know if you've got any experience of the Unify. Yeah, I have. I, I, you know what, I think he also looked at what Kef was doing at the time. I mean, look, his background was Kef. And, and when you look at the fact, you know, that Kef was doing, you know, so much business with the LS50, you know, Kef's sort of, you know, coaxial drivers, concentric Kef's UniQ, those type of drivers have become more popular in the high-end audio space in recent years. And, and I have to think that at some on some level, Andrew looked at what Kef was doing and he saw the success that they were having. And because he knew a lot about, you know, the engineering wherewithal of Kef having been there for so long, you know, he probably figured that maybe this was the type of strategy that would work, but he would make speakers that were more affordable than what Kef was offering and capitalize on, you know, the fact that also, you know, the high-end audio press sometimes has the attention span of a gnat. So we see something that's hot and we, and we all run and jump and like, like a bunch of rabid dogs and, you know, you know, we wag our tails and, and, you know, and we go crazy in front of the, you know, the, the manufacturers for a few months and then we move on to the next thing. Right. And, and I, I, I actually, I'm, I'm kind of with you on this. I liked the original speakers that he came out with better. I, th I thought they were more balanced sounding. I thought that they, they were designed for a much larger pool you know, of listeners and not necessarily audiophiles. Right. Yeah, that's good. So what's your, have you got any other, I'm sure you've got other honorable mentions in this. I, yes, I do. Category. So, um, and this is a, this is a brand new speaker actually, um, that I'm actually, my review is going to be up in about two weeks. Um, the acoustic energy a 100 squared, and I, I kind of hate how they did that, but um, so Acoustic Energy is a brand that both you and I have had a fair bit of experience. Damn, with you beat me to time. it. <laughs> yeah, it, no, but like you know what? It, it's I mean their distribution in, in North America is problematic. It, it's it's never been stable. Whereas you know you being in the UK, you being you know on their home turf, you know you have access to dealers and other places that, that carry them as like one of their you know main main lines. Acoustic energy just seems to be doing everything well right now. I, I have another pair that are coming in after these go back, a much larger pair of floor standers. And I just like their speakers. They're well made. I mean, they're very attractive. The finishes on their, the speakers are just, uh, I, I think they look great. The, the AE100 AE uh, squared, it's a very awkward way of them. <laughs> I don't know. The marketing guys there have we'll, to come up better. Yeah. We'll call it Mark II. Mark II. <laughs> But yeah, but but it's just it's just a very balanced sounding speaker. The bass extends, you know, just deep enough for a bookshelf speaker. It kind of has the the like in many ways, like the AE one had that kind of immediacy that you and I loved. Like it, it was such an such an engaging loudspeaker. I I, I that, that's one of those speakers I really regret not buying. Like the day I hooked them up and listened to them, and my mouth kind of my mouth hit the floor. I was like, oh, these are these are good. Yeah. Um, yeah, very impressive. Actually, Speak, I, yeah, I spent yeah. quite a bit of time with those when I reviewed them, and they did some very clever things. You know, with um, it was it was an attractive looking speaker, the Mark One, and I yeah. think the criticism was it didn't have enough bass, and they thought actually we need to increase the size of the driver. Right, right. But um, so they increased the size of the driver, but then they thought we don't want to massively increase the size of the cabinet. Cabinet, so, yeah. So they basically went to a HDF rather than MDF, and it's retain the you know nice appealing looks and uh, uh that the original had but it's got you know more bass obviously and it's just i expected it to have you know fairly solid bass and it's not the bassiest speaker that no. uh, around that price no. so no. so i haven't i didn't hear the mark one so i should imagine maybe that was light in the bass this one's just good solid bass yeah it's the, and, and it's, the, it's the mid range it's the mid range is just not of a speaker around that price it's just no. the openness the tonality yeah, yeah. they 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 have i mean i remember the old acoustic energy speakers from the 80s and they were very open but i also thought they were very bright sounding you know i, I know a lot of people really really liked them and held them in high regard and i think it also had to do with the amplifiers that they were obviously using with them i, I just find the acoustic energy speakers just like 
you don't know what to expect from them because like in the grand scheme of things, like they're not sexy. And I, and I know the A people won't like that, but, but, but maybe that's a good thing in a way because, because you set them up and you look at them and you say, yes, they're very visually appealing, you know, but, but, but they don't have that kind of drama of the Kef LS or the Elax or a pair of paradigms, you know, with essentially also like almost like a, a single driver. They're not um, flashy. They're, they're not flashy sim- at all. Yes. Yeah. Sim- simple, elegant, aren't they? Yeah. And, and then you connect them to a good amplifier and you put on some music and you're kind of like, okay, what's going on here? Wow. This sounds a lot different than the speaker that I just sent back. That was twice the price. Um, and you, you sort of just kind of, I mean, with me, the a one is a reach out and grab you by the throat in a way kind of speaker. And it kind of like, it just like pulls you like very close into the performance and, it, and it's very dynamic and it has way more bass than you would imagine from a speaker of that size. The AE100 Mark II doesn't obviously have that level of dynamics. I mean, I mean, I mean, but it's also the amplifier that is built into the AE1 is custom for those drivers. And it's a class A B amplifier. It's not a class D amplifier. It's a it's a real class A B amplifier. And the and, a, and the speaker has massive heat sinks on the back. You know, it, ha- it has a pro audio side to it in a way the way that it's designed. Yeah. And but I really like the AE one. I'm not going to give away the rest of the review, but the AE 100 two are really good speakers. If I was at Paradigm and PSB and Elac. Um, I would want to listen to the AE 100s just to see what acoustic energy is doing because they're 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 onto something with these speakers for the price. Yeah, they did. It was very impressive. I think yeah. that would that that is my go to pick bookshelf speaker. At, you know, here it's two hundred and fifty nine pounds. I mean, it's just ridiculous value. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They sent me like the the glossy kind of like walnut like finish, the one that looks like real walnut. And I actually thought it was real wall. When I took it out of the box, I was like, uh, this is obviously like a laminate of some kind, but it looks real. Like it looks and feels real. The way that actually how they finished everything about it, it does not look like an inexpensive speaker whatsoever. I, I got the first batch that landed in the UK. So the MD from, of AE rang me up directly and said, it's here. Do you want it? I said, absolutely, send it. And um, the walnut wasn't out then, so it was white and oh, black. Okay. That came that yeah. came out a little bit later, so a few weeks later. But uh, yeah, that's hugely impressive. Yeah. My other honourable mention um, is a speaker that doesn't get talked about very much these days. It's been out for quite a while, but I always thought, again, for tonality in the mid range, and it's not something that I reviewed at home. So it'd be interesting to see how it scales up in terms of you know with better amplification. Um, but that would be the Dali Spectre Two. And there's something about that wood pulp cone right. in a Dali speaker that gives a very natural tonality in the mid range, which I always found very appealing. Is that the red driver? It's got a reddish kind of, and it literally looks like wood chip or something. Okay. You know? It's a wood paper pulp. And um, even though it's been around for quite a while, and I, I reviewed the Dali Minuet SE, which is such a much higher price point. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't mind. Um, taking a look at that just to, to see how good that really is. But it's it's a speaker that would always be on my short list if I was looking at speakers around that price, even though it's not new. Actually, it's funny you mentioned Dolly because I just did two print and one video review of the Dolly Catch G2 wireless speaker. Okay. And, and it is actually going to be, at this point, my wireless loudspeaker of the year. Wow. Um, and, and it's only 400 and I don't, I don't remember. It's, yeah, it's 499 first, first of all, it's stunning. At first, I thought it was a Bang & Olufsen speaker because it has that Bang & Olufsen sort of industrial design. It's just – it's beautifully made. Everything about it feels expensive. There are drivers also on both sides of it. So there is a tweeter, a mid-range, and a passive uh, driver on both sides. And you get you get a surprising amount of impact from it, and I mean, I mean, the bass is not going to like you know shake your room or rattle your teeth, but my living room is twenty by thirteen, my office is thirty five by thirteen, my li- my main listening room is sixteen by thirteen, and in my kitchen is sixteen by thirteen, and I have kind of rotated it in various tables, surfaces in my kitchen. I have it on the counter, and I I have just you know I've I stream from my phone directly to it. And I can barely even get to the midway point on the volume. It fills every one of these rooms 
w- without even flinching. And the mid range is so clean, and, and and there's so much kind of resolution through this Bluetooth speaker that I'm just like I've been listening to it like even on the couch. Wow. And, so yeah, Dolly. I so I get your Dolly pick. Dolly Dolly is one of these brands that North American audiophiles do not give enough credit. And and I think now because Lenbrook is the distributor for Dolly in North America, Dolly's going to end up in a lot more stores. I'm already starting to see Dolly actually physically in stores. So I, I think Lenbrook's being very aggressive. Like essentially, if you want to carry NAD, PSB, and Blue Sound, you have to carry Dolly as well. That's very interesting. 